Welcome back to part two of the first series of WCH Crime, the Columbia Eagle Mutiny. At this point in the story, Al was now married and his wife was pregnant. He might have continued to settle down, but in early 1970 he met Clive McKay and together they hatched a plan to take over a ship that was carrying US military equipment to be used in the Vietnam War. It's the case of the successful two-man mutiny aboard the American munitions ship Columbia Eagle. Two crewmen were armed when they took control of the cargo ship. The hijackers, meanwhile, went on. Clyde was a few years older than Al, and he was in a pretty turbulent stage of his life. Clyde William McKay Jr. was born on the 20th of May, 1944. His father was a military lifer, um, and so the family moved around quite a bit, both in and out of the United States, because uh, he was a, a, a military man. This is Roberto Lloydman. Roberto's a writer who was a merchant marine in the Vietnam era as well, and co-wrote a book, The Eagle Mutiny, with Richard Lynette. Researching the book, they interviewed many of Clyde's friends and family to find out what his life was like before the mutiny. Clyde was the oldest of six children, and so um, the feeling I got uh, when interviewing uh, Clyde's mother and his sisters that um, that Clyde was not happy at being uh, the surrogate father whenever his, uh, his father was away on, on military duty. Uh, he was a, a rebellious kid uh, who left uh, school before graduating high school. Um, he joined uh, the Merchant Marine when he was 18, 19 years old. Um, and when he, when he did that, he did it in his usual, in his normal determined way. He, he, had a, um, he bought a bicycle, a broken bicycle for $5, living in Hemet, California, uh, which was about 70 miles from San Diego. Uh, he drove, he fixed that bicycle and drove all, he drove it all night to get to San Diego to be with his Aunt Ruth, who helped him get, uh, make the contact that he needed to make in order to get into the Merchant Marine. After he left home, Clyde had an interesting life. He jumped ship one time in Thailand, he stumbled into a leper colony, he spent two stints in jail in Franco, Spain, he got lost on foot in the Sahara Desert and nearly died. But one key experience he had was a military service. This came about one night in a bar when Clyde ran into some guys he admired. They were in the French Foreign Legion, and Clyde ended up joining them. But he quickly discovered that army life wasn't for him. He hated the discipline and the obedience to authority, and he realised that for his mental health he had to get out. In the end, Clyde managed to bribe a doctor to get out of the Legion. He then had a lot of difficulty getting back to the States, as he was told that by serving the French Foreign Legion, he'd effectively given up his American citizenship. But eventually, he managed to resolve that and get back home. But for the people who knew him, like his family and his friend John Stafford, he had changed. The sisters and the mother say that when Clyde McKay, at the end of 1967, got back to uh, California, he was a different person. He was a changed person from the person, from the Clyde McKay that they had known before. That he was um, somehow strangely spiritual, but also very political very much distant from normal human feelings and normal human relationships. At the end of 1967, Clyde went back to work as a merchant mariner. He worked on a number of ships, and several of them went to Vietnam during the war, carrying ammo. By 1969, Clyde had felt extremely guilty about having helped the war effort, so he resolved to do something about it. He told John Safford that he wanted to do something dramatic, uh to stop an ammo ship from getting to Vietnam. Uh, Safford thought this was just hot air, that it was, you know, the kind of bullshit that uh, that people say. Uh, he, he never believed that McKay actually had something like that in mind. So Alan Clyde had decided they would try to organise a mutiny, and they both signed on to a merchant ship carrying materials to be used in the Vietnam War, the SS Columbia Eagle. It was carrying napalm, the gasoline jelly the US military was dropping hundreds of thousands of tons of on the people of Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. Clyde got a job in the engine room and Al as an officer steward, a sort of support staff member for the captain and other officers on the ship. With nothing more than Clyde's gun and a rough plan, they shipped off to sea. Well, we were still unsure with each other how serious we were because we had discussed and realised that, that at best, we would be arrested and go to prison. 
uh, the rest of our lives, and at worst, we would be killed and never see our families again. And nobody else would know anything about us. We we would sit and discuss things privately. We would go for a walk on the ship or go back in a place where we knew that there would be nobody and where we could keep an eye on their surroundings and who was around us. There are a whole load of questions they didn't have answers to yet. How would they take control of the ship? How would they deal with the other crew members on board? Where would they even go after mutiny? And how would they evade the US military who would surely try to intervene? A practical problem they had was that they still only had one gun, which, as the captain also had a gun, wouldn't leave them in a strong position to take over the ship, which also had over 30 other crew members. They solved this quite simply by buying one on the docks during a pit stop in Subic Bay in the Philippines and smuggling it on board. But they still faced the problem of how they would actually go about taking control of the ship. The story of the Badger State, the ship that exploded and sank, gave Clyde the start of an idea. The napalm of the ship they were on, the Columbia Eagle, was, of course, very explosive. Then, one day, something happened which gave Al an idea. Uh, unscheduled fire drill. There's one thing that's incredibly important on board a ship carrying munitions, and that is fire control. And so we're all drilled on those things. But normally they would announce them. But one day they just decided to do one without an announcement. My particular position was at a life raft. And so I was able to see what was happening from an upper perspective where I could see people at different stations on the ship. And it was like the bingo, the light went off. Al was so excited that he ran down below deck to meet Clyde and explain what he'd realized. I uh, looked at him, and I will never forget this. I must have had the biggest grin on my face, and I, I told him, I, I clapped him on the shoulder, and I said, I figure, I know what to do. I figured it out. If there's a, a fire on board, everybody stops doing their normal jobs, and they go to these fire stations. What happens on it, uh, when the fire drill uh, is extended, and they actually drop the lifeboats? And if they drop the lifeboats, there's got to be crews in those lifeboats. What that meant was they could use a fire drill to evacuate the ship and most of the crew. While some crew members were sympathetic to the anti-war movement and the counterculture, others, especially the older ones, were really supportive of the war effort, like the chief mate, Herrick Morgan, who despised hippies and war protesters. We were thinking of how we could do this without injuring other people, because in his exuberance, Clyde, was he didn't care if we injured other people, but I did. I, I just couldn't see myself killing someone for just because they they were there when we can there's got to be ways to get them off the vessel when i discovered this possibility that changed things for us changed things for clyde and he immediately grasped what i was saying clyde had come up with the idea that he was going to announce that there was a bomb on board the ship and that uh, we had the ability to detonate it that there was more than one and therefore we needed to abandon ship. This posed another problem, though. They didn't want to injure the rest of the crew, but they also didn't want to strand them all at sea. And while they were thinking about how they'd take over the ship, they also had to think about what they'd do if they could even pull it off. What would they do with the ship? Where would they go? Some answers came by some seemingly innocent snooping on Al's part. And what we came up with was, because I was the, the officer's steward, I could go up and talk to the officers and ask them for, show me the positioning on the map, you know, like some young kid, you know, just wanting to know, you know, and they wanted to be helpful and would show me. And one of the officers would help me do it. And I would say, well, how long will it take us? What time can we be at this particular point right here? Well, let's figure it out. And he would try to show me how to figure it out. And so I was able to find out how far back the next ship was uh, and how many hours away, our speed and, and where we expect to be at such, such a time. The information Al learned about positioning was crucial. It helped them first figure out that the ships in the fleet behind them would be able to pick up the stranded crew in lifeboats within just a few hours of the mutiny. Second, it gave them an idea of where they could go once they took over the ship. Clyde and I discussed, well, uh, Cambodia being a neutral country, maybe we could just take the ship to Cambodia. And uh, if we could get it to Cambodia, then we would be safe. Cambodia at the time was ruled by Prince Norodom Sihanouk, a former king who abdicated, then formed a political party which won the 1955 general election after independence from France. He then imposed one-party rule. Officially, his government was neutral in foreign relations, although in practice it was closer to the socialist states than the West. And it was essentially turning a blind eye to North Vietnam ferrying troops and equipment to the south through the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail, 
which ran through Laos and rural eastern Cambodia. These were the main areas being secretly bombed by the US since 1965. There was also no extradition agreement with the US. So it was a good choice for a final destination. Al even hoped if they got asylum, his wife and child could join him there. Back on the ship, if Al and Clyde were able to capture it, before they got anywhere they'd need to avoid the US military, which would soon find out about the mutiny and try to stop them. We thought that the US might land on our ship and try to capture us and we would probably be killed in a shootout. Our goal was to keep them away as far as possible for as long as possible. And the easiest solution that when I talked with Clyde was that we run on radio silence. So that meant we had to capture the radio operator. They also found out one critical piece of information that might help them avoid conflict with US forces for as long as possible. What they found out was that the rest of the world knew the ship's location only at a certain time of the day. In the mornings, the officers would use their navigation instruments to take measurements. And then they would determine their location, and at 12 o'clock noon, that location is uh, immediately sent to the shipping company. From that point on, you're not in touch with that shipping company again until the next day at noon. We determined that if we were to do something, it had to be immediately after the 12 noon signal went out. That would give them nearly 24 hours from the noon signal until the next day's noon signal, when the rest of the world would have no idea that anything was amiss. Over the next day or two, I was able to get more information, and then it was time to make our move. I stationed myself close by to the radio operator shack, and I could hear him sending our location. Once he confirmed that the radio operator had sent the signal, he headed down to a room where he and Clyde could prepare without anyone noticing. When we got the guns out to clean them, I got up and I told Clyde, I'll be right back. I'm going to go to the bathroom before we do this. Looked at the mirror and I said uh, to myself, um, you may not live through this. This may be your last few minutes. And this brings us back to that moment we started with. Clyde and Al could be killed, or be locked up forever and never see their families again. What if they just turned back now? There was plenty of napalm making it into the war anyway. What would this accomplish? But then again, what would their future children think of them if they turned back now? I will never, ever be able to see or look my children in the face when they ask me, what did you do to stop the war? Dad, you will be able to say that you did your duty to stop it. You did your best to stop it. And I walked around, turned around, went out the door, got the gun, must move. They started first by finding the chief mate, Morgan. Remember, the one who hated anti-war activists, who might try to be a hero. They forced him into the captain's lounge, where the captain was too, and held the two of them at gunpoint, until there was a knock on the door. Something had to be handed over to the captain, and he came to the door and knocked on the door, and then I, so I interrupted him and said, hey, thanks, do me a favor. Uh, the captain would like to talk to the chief radio operator. Can you ask him to come over? He goes, not a problem. He went on over it. Got him to come over, and then we had the captain, the first mate, we had the chief radio operator, we had the three big key players. They told the captain that they had a bomb aboard the ship, and they were ready to detonate it. They told them they were taking control of the ship, and that they wanted the ship to be evacuated, leaving only a skeleton crew at the minimum number needed to keep it afloat and moving. We had the captain do the fire drill, then in an abandoned ship. So he had to talk to the mates upstairs in the bridge. And uh, when they did the abandoned ship, they asked, are you serious? And he goes, yes. They followed his orders and did what he said. The ship was abandoned. And as they were doing it, we asked them to cast off the lines. That's the last thing you do on an abandoned ship is cast off the lines. And uh, so there were several uh, sailors on board that we were concerned about, but we thought they would be over and gone down with the boats, but they didn't. They were up on the lifeboat decks, tending the lines before they were cast off, which we weren't prepared for. We, in other words, we had too, too many people on that ship. When they were told to cast lines off, they wanted to know what was going on. Maybe they had done a quick analysis on who was around and who wasn't around, 
and figured that, that it wasn't a drill and that maybe Clyde and I were uh, had done something. And we told the captain to tell the mate on duty that there was a bomb on board and that they had to cast them off right now because of uh, the, the possibility of it exploding. In those tense few moments, the rest of the crew followed the procedure. They got into the boats. Once they were cast off, we moved from the lounge up to the bridge deck. We secured the um, radio room so that nothing could be transmitted. And then we uh, exposed ourselves by stepping off the bridge deck to the flying bridge and telling the lifeboats that they needed to move away quickly. Leaned over and yelled down to them that uh, there was a vessel uh, three or four miles behind. You'll be able to get it if you head it in a particular direction. And just like that, they had control of the Columbia Eagle. The next question was, could they make it to Cambodia without losing control of the ship or getting caught? I was on the radar uh, quite often during that time, that first day. We stayed up that whole night, that first night. There was no way to sleep. The next day we took shifts. I think we dozed an hour each that night, if that. Clyde now thought that Herrick Morgan, the chief mate, would be their biggest problem. And sure enough, he was. In Roberto's book, The Eagle Mutiny, Morgan and another crew member describe what they say happened. Morgan had found a crowbar. Clyde had been sitting for some time by the door of the wheelhouse. He had his gun, but Morgan thought with the element of surprise, he could lay him out, get his gun, and then go after Al. But as Morgan crept up on Clyde, Al clocked him and yelled to Clyde to look out. Clyde spun round and fired. The bullet didn't hit anything, but Morgan dropped the crowbar and put his hands up. The mutineers then apparently told the chief mate that if he tried anything else, they would kill him. Then they went round the ship gathering hammers, axes, crowbars, anything which could potentially be used as a weapon, and throwing them overboard. After that, there were no other attempts by the crew to wrest back control of the ship. And during the 24-hour period after the radio broadcast, just as planned, they didn't see any signs that the US military had realised what was going on. But then noon the following day rolled around. We started being buzzed uh, by an American plane. If it had come any closer, we were going to shoot it. I'm certain we would have hit it. It was that close. Even with pistols, we would have hit it. I mean, we could clearly see the pilot and the co-pilot. We took a flag, an American flag, the, the ship's flag, out of the uh, bin and set it on the deck and painted a band the bomb symbol on it. And then we hung the flag off the side of the, uh, of the vessel. Shortly after that, we started getting a, a tremendous amount of radio interference. Uh, there were other vessels that were coming towards us. Uh, from different directions. We didn't know if we were going to be missiles or what at that point. We didn't know what they would do because it, it was basically either they stopped that ship or, or it was gone. By this point, it was 15th of March and they were in Cambodian waters. One of the ships heading towards them was the US Coast Guard Cutter Melon, so they needed to make their next move. We broke radio silence. I allowed the radio operator to transmit his position and what our goals were, that we wanted political asylum in Cambodia that we were taking the ship, that we wanted it interred uh, and held by the Cambodian government. They also made contact with the Mellon and warned them and other American craft to stay away, stating that they would go to any lengths to keep the cargo from reaching its destination, even to scuttling the vessel. This set off a scurry of diplomatic activity. The US Embassy in Saigon contacted the Secretary of State William Rogers, who sent a telegram to the military and every American embassy in Southeast Asia requesting approval from the Cambodian government to allow US forces to enter Cambodian waters to seize the vessel or failing that to apprehend the pirates and return the vessel themselves. After that, on the ship, everything went quiet, and they just had to wait. After what must have been a pretty torturous waiting game, the following evening, 16th of March, two Cambodian vessels arrived. Naval officers boarded the Columbia Eagle, surveyed the cargo and spoke to the captain. Meanwhile, Alan Clyde were taken aboard the Cambodian gunboat to speak to the Naval Chief of Staff, Captain Ang, where they explained what they'd done and why. Formally requested asylum, and managed to convince Captain Am that the non-existent bomb they used to hijack the ship had been disposed of. To the incredulity of the Columbia Eagle's remaining crew, the Cambodians then returned the mutineers' guns and put them back on board while they headed back to shore, where they contacted Prince Sihanouk, who at the time was on an international chore of China and the Soviet Union. The next day, 17th of March, Alan Clyde got their response from the Cambodian authorities, and it looked like the mutineers had made a good choice of safe haven. Sihanouk initially agreed and allowed us to come in with political asylum and holding the vessel for the uh, duration of the Indo-Chinese War. That was our demand. That's all we asked, political asylum, and that you 
hold the ship for the duration of the Vietnam War to keep the cargo out of the war. So at that moment, Al and Clyde had got everything they wanted. The US military would be unable to use their deadly cargo to kill innocent civilians in Indochina. They'd be safe to live in neutral Cambodia and even bring their families over to join them. And all that without having harmed anyone. But they could never have predicted what happened next, which threatened to undo everything they'd done. This is the end of part two. The relevant levels of our Patreon supporters can listen to the rest of this series now, as well as bonus audio with more information about Clyde's earlier life and adventures. So if you don't already, you can support us, get early access to episodes and other benefits at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. For everyone else, future parts will be out each week. You can get Roberto and Rich's book, The Eagle Mutiny, on the link in the show notes. If you enjoy our podcast, please give us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or share it on social media to help us get more listeners. Thanks to our patrons for making this podcast possible. This episode was written and produced by WCH and Daniel Wardorf. Audio editing by Daniel Wardorf. Music composed by Austin Coulson. Catch you next time. Mm-hmm.